Um, well, hello, good afternoon, and a very, very warm welcome to the second lunch bar um, of Cross-Examined Week. And for those of you who don't know me, my name's Tom. I'm a third-year geographer up here in Durham, and I'm also a member um, of the Christian Union. And Cross-Examined, which is um, one of the little flies you've got on, the, on your seats there, Cross-Examined is the name of a week of events um, we're running as a Christian Union to help you to dig a little bit deeper into the claims of Jesus for yourself. Um, we kicked off yesterday lunchtime by thinking about um, whether or not we can really take the Bible seriously. Is it all just fanciful fiction? If you missed that, by the way, um, there's a website which is on the back of these flies. That would be a really good place to start. It's um, www.crossexamined.co.uk. We're going to have all of the talks throughout the week up on that website. So if you missed that talk, do please log on to the interweb later today and look at it. Um, but today, we're going to be asking about the resurrection. Um, impossible and unproven. How can you prove that Jesus rose from the dead. Um, Adrian Holloway, who's um, with us for the week, is going to be talking to us. So Adrian, why don't you come and join me? And uh, am I right in saying you were a student here in Durham um, five or so years ago? Um, why don't you just tell us a little bit about that? Oh, you're, you're, you're very kind. I was a student in Durham from 1988 to 1991. I have got one photo of my time as a student, uh, which you're going to see now. Uh, this is me uh, in a band. Um, I was, my whole goal when I was a student here was to be cool. And one of the things I tried to do to become cool was to turn my collar up, which I can do, I'm doing here in this picture. But however, I'm now 45 years old. I've got teenage children. They've told me that I'm definitely not cool. So I failed to be cool. Um, for those of you who weren't here yesterday, don't know how it works, we're going to have a short 20-minute talk from Adrian now, uh, followed by a question time. Um, so any questions at all, please do send them in to the number on the screen. Um, we'll pause at 10 to, um, so if you'd like to leave, feel free to do so. If not, we'll carry on and we'll formally end play at about quarter past two this afternoon. But now, um, over to Adrian to help us think about this question. Thank you very much. Well, uh, Folks, when I myself was a skeptic, uh, it was historical evidence that persuaded me that Jesus must have risen physically from the dead. And that is a key reason why I decided to turn around and start following Christ. And there are well over a billion people alive today who are convinced that Jesus of Nazareth has punched a hole through the barrier of death and that everyone who trusts in him will follow Jesus through that barrier into heaven. On Thursday lunchtime, we'll see Jesus claiming to be God. But so what? Well, crucially, Jesus predicted that he would back up his claim to be God by rising from the dead. But did Jesus really rise from the dead? Dr. Gary Habermas made a detailed study of all 2,200 or so books and articles that credentialed scholars have published on the resurrection since 1975. Habermas is considered to have researched the output of scholars scrutinizing the resurrection more exhaustively than anyone else. He and his colleague, Dr. Michael Lycona, then selected only those facts that the vast majority of scholars, including skeptical ones, accept as historical fact. In other words, they ignored material, including material in the New Testament, which is most heavily challenged by skeptical scholars. They chose to work only with the facts that the vast majority of academics, both Christian and non-Christian, accept as being reliable. And so using this restrained, cautious approach, I hope to argue a case for the resurrection using just four minimal facts. Facts that are accepted even by scholars who oppose the resurrection. So here's the first one, that Jesus was crucified and died as a result. John Dominic Crossan, the co-founder of the so-called Jesus Seminar, has spent most of his academic life trying to uh, debunk historic Christianity. But even he admits, quote, that Jesus was crucified 
is as sure as anything historical can ever be. James D. Tabor, another high-profile attacker of Christianity, agrees. Tabor says, We need have no doubt that given Jesus' execution by Roman crucifixion, Jesus was truly dead. More importantly, our ancient non-Christian sources, Tacitus, Josephus, the Jewish Babylonian Talmud, and Lucian of Samosata, they all say that Jesus was crucified. And all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they report Jesus' death on the cross. Now, of course, academic New Testament scholars wouldn't treat Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as infallible scripture or even as scripture at all. And for the purposes of this lunch bar, we won't either. We can simply accept the Gospels for what they unquestionably are, which is that they are ancient documents written sometime before the end of the first century, which can be subjected to historical scrutiny. And there are lots of other reasons why modern skeptics are so sure that Jesus died by crucifixion. For starters, these Roman soldiers were a professional execution team. They were experts at executing people. Besides, if a prisoner escaped death, they, the soldiers, might be put to death themselves as a result. So these soldiers had a huge incentive to make absolutely sure that Jesus was dead before they removed his body from the cross. The gospel writers report that they thrust a spear into his heart to make sure that he was already dead before they took his body down. Just so happens we now know that the separated water and blood that came out of that spear wound actually turns out to be good medical evidence that Jesus was already dead at that point. But could Jesus possibly have survived crucifixion? Maybe Jesus survived crucifixion and then in the cool air of the tomb he recovered enough strength to roll away the stone and overpower the guards and then appear to his disciples. In my book, Aftershock, I wrote, the idea that Jesus never died on the cross asks us to believe that a man could survive a Roman flogging, a crucifixion from the world's most professional execution force, and a spear through his heart, then unwrap himself from yards of cloth probably soaked in 34 kilograms of spice, push away a huge stone, fight his way past up to maybe 16 guards, and then appear to his disciples as the picture of health, successfully convincing them that one day they could have a glorious resurrection body just like his. This explanation also requires Jesus to become a liar and a hoaxer who contrived the world's most elaborate deception, Christianity. I don't think it's altogether surprising that this survival theory has never really got off the ground. But in the Q&A afterwards, please let's talk back and forth, do texting questions because we don't have a lot of time to rattle through these four facts. Here's the second one. That Jesus' tomb was empty. Now, even an atheist historian will tell you that on the third day after Jesus' death, his tomb was empty. Three days after Jesus' body was buried, it simply wasn't there. Now, why are atheists willing to admit that the tomb was empty? Answer, because historians agree that if Jesus' dead body had been in the tomb, then the Jews or the Romans definitely would have produced it as soon as the first Christians started declaring, Jesus is alive. But Jesus of Nazareth had been such a political threat to the Romans and such a blasphemous threat to the Jews that the two groups had conspired together to get Jesus killed. The whole point was to snuff out Jesus and his embryonic movement. So the last thing they wanted was Jesus' disciples persuading people that he'd risen from the dead. If they had the body, then as the disciples toured Jerusalem, punching the air, saying, yes, Christ is risen, the Jews or the Romans would have followed with Jesus' dead body on a cart behind the disciples saying, no, no, he's not alive. Look. 
He's dead. Here's his dead body. But neither the Jews nor the Romans ever did produce his body. That's because they themselves could see that the tomb was empty. Folks, strictly speaking, Christianity should not exist. It should have been instantly disproved by either the Jews or the Romans who had the dead body of Jesus in a sealed tomb, in a sealed tomb which according to the Gospels was guarded by soldiers. So the Jews or the Romans would have produced the body if they'd had it. The reason they didn't was because Jesus' body had gone missing. The best they could do at the time to explain this phenomenon was to say that the disciples had stolen his body, which, if nothing else, proves that they definitely did not have the body. Again, we can talk about this in the Q&A. Minimal fact number three. Jesus' disciples believed that he rose and that he appeared to them. Okay, now what about these resurrection appearances? Aren't they just legends that kind of grew up over time? I mean, after all, wasn't it hundreds of years after the fact that these resurrection appearance stories eventually did get written down? Well, we know that's not the case for the reasons that we looked at yesterday lunchtime. But suffice to say that hundreds, rather than being hundreds of years later, our earliest record of the resurrection appearances can be traced back to within a few months of the actual event. Yesterday, we spent a long time looking at this very early creed. And we said there is wide agreement amongst scholars that this list of resurrection appearances was created before 35 AD. So by 35 AD, this list was well established. And this shows that the resurrection appearances are as old as Christianity itself, that they're not a much later legendary development. So we have a very early report of Jesus' resurrection. Question. Hang on a minute. What if the resurrection appearances were actually hallucinations? I mean, people who hallucinate, they want to see something so badly that they really think they are seeing it. I mean, what if the disciples imagined the resurrection? Well, psychologists study hallucinations. And just to be clear, for this idea to work, we would have to say that all 550 or so people who said they saw the resurrected Jesus on 11 different occasions over a period of six weeks were all hallucinating the same thing. That everyone who had meals with him, that those who said they touched him, that those who had long conversations with him, all of these people were hallucinating. Now here's the problem. Psychologists tell us there is no such thing as a group hallucination. We don't know of any group hallucinations. Only one person can see a specific hallucination at any one time. There's no reason to think that I could ever produce a hallucination in you. Remember, the whole point of a hallucination is that there's nothing actually there. So if I'm having a hallucination, it is all happening in my mind. Nobody else can see exactly what I'm seeing. So even if two people did hallucinate the resurrected Jesus at the same time, for one person he might be uh, eating a piece of fish, but for the other person he might be flying through the air. Let's face it, hallucinations are very rare. They're usually caused by either bodily deprivation or by drugs. Are we being asked to believe that over the course of many weeks, hundreds of people from all kinds of different backgrounds all had identical simultaneous hallucinations? And individuals who do hallucinate don't usually suddenly stop. So the number of resurrection appearances and the fact that they came to an abrupt halt make the hallucination theory even more unlikely. Remember, a few seconds ago, we saw our earliest source says that over 500 people saw the risen Jesus at one time. Now let's say for the sake of the argument that two people could see the resurrected Jesus at the same time. That's two. 500? Remember, hallucinations can't be touched. They're not tangible. Yet the resurrected Jesus was tangible. Even so, because there are so few options, I had expected, as a skeptic myself, that this option would win more supporters. 
Hardly anyone has ever argued seriously for it because hallucinations are restricted to individuals. But hey, there is another alternative, isn't there? Maybe the disciples just lied. I mean, what if they did steal Jesus' body? And then they began a rumor that Jesus had risen from the dead. Okay, we are talking about the world's most successful deception. Let's imagine the disciples did steal the body. Now, I've always found this a bit hard to believe in the first place because these men were strict Jews who lived to a very high moral standard. Are we really going to say that these men went all over the world telling people that Jesus had risen from the dead when all the time they knew for a fact that he wasn't risen, they knew in their hearts that they'd nicked the body and buried it somewhere, I don't know, in Peter's back garden or wherever it was. The biggest problem with this argument is that the disciples didn't just say that Christ is risen, they died for it. Question, hang on, hang on a minute. That's not a problem at all. People all over the world die for their religious beliefs. Yes. Yes, they die for things they believe in. People tend not to die for lies that they know for a fact is a lie because they themselves made up the lie. These disciples were in the unique position of knowing without a doubt whether or not they had stolen the body and hoaxed the resurrection. If they had stolen the body and somehow hoaxed the resurrection appearances, would they have allowed themselves to be martyred and tortured to death for their lies? Because that is what happened. Peter was crucified upside down in 64 AD. The disciples Bartholomew and Philip were crucified. Andrew was crucified with ropes, and so the list goes on. You see, the disciples were literally crucified for their belief in the resurrection. Even at the last minute, as they're on the cross, they could have escaped death just by admitting that they'd stolen Jesus' body. If the resurrection was a scam they'd invented, don't you think at least one of them would have cracked and said, oh, for goodness sake, cut me down, cut me down from this cross. It was just a lie we made up. We were feeling a bit depressed and we made up the story. And, but, it's not our, but none of them said that. They all went to the stake or the cross. They died in different ways. None of them ever said that it was a lie. They all said to the very end, Christ is risen. Anyway, our third minimal fact, which is accepted even by skeptics, is that the disciples weren't deliberately lying. They genuinely believed that Jesus had appeared to them. The fourth minimal fact is the conversion of the anti-Christian persecutor of the church, Saul of Tarsus. I'll be very quick on this. We do have very good evidence that this bloke called Saul of Tarsus, who really was opposed to Christianity in a violent way, said he personally saw the resurrected Jesus and had a conversation with him. We have six ancient sources, Luke, Clement of Rome, Polycarp, Tertullian, Dionysius, and Origen, and they all confirm this newly converted man who changed his name to Paul, he was willing to suffer continuously. He was even willing to die for this resurrected Jesus that he had seen. Okay, so we've looked at four minimal facts. Let's pause. Let's imagine that our first initial goal, the first thing we want to do is we want to undermine, we want to discredit the alleged resurrection of Jesus. Okay, fair enough. We need to come up with something, some sort of alternative theory, because any attempt to explain away these facts can't leave any of them out. Now, if you were part of a jury, if you were a juror in central London at the Old Bailey, if the judge had just sent you out to consider your verdict, at this point, as you're sitting around in your little group, you yourself would be looking for a verdict that best fits the available facts. You'd be looking for a verdict that doesn't minimize or strain the known facts. You'd be looking for the verdict that best fits the facts that aren't in dispute. Ladies and gentlemen, the reason why I became convinced that Jesus must have risen from the dead is because the resurrection explanation outdistances all the competing hypotheses by such a large margin. The resurrection explanation is the only explanation that can accommodate all the known facts. 
For example, let's imagine we say, well, come off, this is ridiculous. The resurrection never happened. I totally sympathize with that. Remember, I used to think that. I used to be a skeptic. Okay, fair enough. We've still got to come up with something to account for the explosive growth of Christianity. We saw yesterday that the historian Tacitus tells us in 64 AD in Rome, there were, quote, an immense number of Christians ready to die for their belief in the resurrected Jesus, 30 years after his crucifixion. Why would an immense number of people in Rome be willing to die, suffer the ultimate humiliation of of of, of dying for this man who himself had been crucified. Why would an immense number worship the scum of the earth? Because that's what a crucified man was. Okay, let's say to explain this phenomenon, I choose the hallucination theory. Well, even if it's true, it still doesn't fit all the minimal facts. Even if I did reject everything psychologists tell us about hallucinations, even if I said Christianity is based on mass hallucination. Fair enough. But I still have to explain the empty tomb. I still got to explain why the authorities didn't produce the real body of Jesus. So Norman Anderson of Trinity College, Cambridge University, who was a world-famous expert on Islamic law, he said, quote, the empty tomb forms a veritable rock upon which all rationalistic theories which attempt to disprove the resurrection dash themselves in vain. But at the end of the day, and at the end of this talk, somebody might understandably say, look, I've come down here, I've eaten the food, I've listened to what you've had to say, I just want you to know that it's not for me. Okay? I mean, Jesus may well be risen for you, but he isn't risen for me. Okay? Well, in response, I'm sure we could all agree that if we had been doubting Thomas, as he reaches out towards the supposedly resurrected Jesus, at some point we either would have touched a real person or we wouldn't have touched a real person. I'm sure we can all agree that if you and I had walked into Jesus' tomb on the first ever Easter Sunday, as we walked into that very small space and looked around, either both of us would have seen no... There isn't a dead body in here. Or we would both have walked into the tomb and said, oh my goodness, look, right, there's a dead body right there. Can you honestly say that as you and I left the tomb, that one of us would have turned to the other and said, well, it may have been empty for you, but it wasn't empty for me. No. History is terribly brutal to relativism. The resurrection isn't just true for Christians. It's either true for everybody because it really did happen, or it isn't true for anyone because it didn't actually happen. Which brings us lastly to the effect right, right now. Tom, do you think you could just bring that microphone stand back, please? Just for a second. Thanks very much. When I was a student in Durham, uh, I lived in St. Aidan's College, and uh, in the late 1980s, I'm afraid to say that the food was absolutely appalling. Thanks very much. You bring it all the way over. And uh, so, uh, I know that's an awful thing to say, but the truth was that um, my, my friend Alan Blackwood had a car. And that was fantastic news for us because Alan was able to take us to my kind of pizza by the viaduct. And so we had lots of late night pizza trips to my kind of pizza. And so it was that we would sit in, uh, in Alan's car eating pizza. And of course, because we were A students and B blokes, it never occurred to us to empty Alan's car of used grease, greasy, dirty pizza boxes. And so as term went by, by about week seven of the term, Alan's car was really chocker with empty pizza boxes. And one night, we got into a situation, we were going for our normal uh, pizza run, and I'm afraid to say that we couldn't get in to Alan's car. I have a friend, one of the five guys who was part of the, pizza, the Alan Blackwood's core pizza group. Uh, he, when he was 34 years old, became a Christian. And he told me, looking back on our student days, on our pizza days, he said to me, Adrian, I did to God what we did to Alan's car. And I said, what? And he said, look, 
what, what we did was we emptied, we so filled the car with pizza boxes that we couldn't get in. That was like my life. I so filled my life with stuff, even totally legitimate stuff, even stuff that's not wrong. I so filled my life with stuff that there was no space for God to get in. I pushed God to the margins of my life because I was so busy with all these other things. I put myself first and God was pushed to the margins. And of course, inevitably, there came that day, week seven of the term, when we had to get these black bin liners and empty Alan's car, because clearly we were deeply committed to pizza, so we needed to go and get some. So we, and I just want you to imagine that if this is the rubbish in our lives, this is what my friend, who became a Christian when he was 34, was kind of saying. If this is our lives, and this is the rubbish in our lives, let's imagine for a moment that God is perfectly pure and holy, and we look like this, well, that's the problem. We can't go and be with God forever. But what if God is real and sends his real son, Jesus Christ, to earth? Let's imagine that Jesus of Nazareth is as perfect and as pure and as white as the sheet. And what the Bible says happened is that God made him who knew no sin, that's Jesus, the white sheet, to become sin for us so that in him, we could be cover, covered over with the righteousness of God. And so if we turn to Christ and if we're clothed with Christ, then even as we leave this room, we can look as pure and as holy in God's sight as Jesus Christ does. And what that means is that when Christ rose from the dead, then we go with him because we're in Christ. Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. If anyone lives and believes in me, he'll live and never die. And so because we're in Christ, just as he goes up into heaven, he's beaten death, we do too, because we're now in Christ. Because there's been an exchange. He takes my sin, and I get his perfection and his righteousness. So folks, if this is true, if Christ is risen, it's the best news that we could ever hear. It means death isn't the end. It means there is hope. It means there's a loving God who cares for you and has a good plan for your life, who wants to enjoy friendship with you, not just in this life, but in the next. It means you are going to a place where you'll never be bored, a place where you'll be filled and thrilled to the max. If Christ is risen, it's the best news that anyone in this room could ever hear. Thank you very much for listening to me. We're now going to take some questions. Uh, well, thank you very much, um, Adrian. Um, incredible to think, isn't it, about the implications of Jesus um, rising from the dead. And I think we'd agree that if he did rise from the dead, then one of the things it might be really sensible to do would be to think about what he actually said. Uh, and there are a number of ways that you might like to go about doing that. One of them would be to take away and read this copy of uh, a biography of Jesus' life. It's called John, written by a dude called John, unsurprisingly, given that it's called John. Um, this was on your chairs as you came in. This is free. It's a gift. I love free things. Why not take it away? It'll take 45 minutes to read. That'd be a really great thing to do. Another thing you might um, like to consider doing would be um, come back tomorrow to hear a little bit more. Um, why don't you take this flyer into your hands? Um, tomorrow, Wednesday, um, a powerless and uncaring, how can a loving God allow so much suffering? So Adrian, you're going to be helping us to think through that tomorrow. Um, by the looks of it, that's at a different venue. Um, that's at St. Oswald's Church, Church Street, um, which is, I, I don't really know what that is, to be honest. Would somebody gesticulate? Yeah. Up towards the library on the right-hand side. Um, so if I can find my way there, I'm sure you can too. Um, that'll be a great thing to come to. Um, but can I particularly encourage you to think about um, maybe coming along to our talk tonight? Um, the talk titles uh, on this flyer are wrong for the evening, so I'm very sorry about that. Um, but it was great to hear from Andrew yesterday um, that God has made himself known in time and space uniquely through Jesus. And so one obvious implication is that we, if we want to know about God, well, we need to look at Jesus. Um, well, tonight, um, Andrew is going to be helping us to examine Jesus' words a little bit more carefully, and in particular, his claims about heaven. Uh, Andrew's going to be speaking on the title, Examine Your Chances, What If Heaven Were For Free? 
Um, it would be great if it, were free, if it were for free, wouldn't it? Because of our, of our own accord, uh, not one of us in the room is going to make it to heaven. So it really would be fantastic if it were free. So why not come along tonight, examine that, examine what Andrew has to say. That's um, 7.30 in Elvet Methodist, which is down the bottom of the road and opposite the Marriott Hotel. Final thing to say is comment cards. What better way to cheer yourself up on, on quite a dreary Tuesday afternoon than by filling in a comment card? They're not only immensely fun, um, but, but seriously, they are very, very helpful for us. Uh, and I, I get in trouble for joking about them. So please, please do. Everyone, it would be really, really helpful for us if you could fill it in. One of, um, one of the really useful things about them is that you can tick a box that says, I want to discover more. So if these are uh, new things you've heard, new claims about Jesus, why not tick that box? And um, there's no obligation to respond to uh, any weird Christian if they phone you up and say, hey, do you want to meet up and think about it a little bit more? But you're not going to lose out by just putting your name down there. So, in fact, why don't we all do that now? So why don't we all pick up our, co our comment cards, pick up a pen, uh, and why don't we fill that in? And that would be a really, really fantastic use of our time now. Um, but while we do that, Adrian, why don't, we, uh, why don't we make a start? We've got loads of questions that have come in on the phone. Um, is it possible to believe in the resurrection without believing in Christianity? Uh, is it possible to believe in the resurrection without believing in Christianity? Yes, I think you could be, you could come to the point where you think that it is beyond reasonable doubt that uh, Christ rose from the dead, but then you have other reasons why you wouldn't want to follow through the implications. So let me give you an example. Um, in the book that you have on your chairs, there's an amazing story of Jesus raising a man called Lazarus from the dead. But it's also clear that there are people who witnessed that event, who made a decision not only not to follow Jesus, but actually to kill him. They resolve, seeing as he's raised Lazarus from the dead, we're definitely going to escalate our plans and we are going to kill him as soon as possible. So clearly they had other reasons, despite there being very good evidence that this man was who he said he was, they didn't want to commit. Um, you know, I'm not just a rational being. The decisions I make aren't simply based upon what I think rationally to be the case. There's also a volitional side. Um, you know, there are things I want or don't want to do. And sometimes what I really think is true and actually what I want to do um, don't come together. Uh, this usually gets me into trouble with my wife. I know what the right thing to do is, but I just want to watch the telly, for example. No, okay. Um, we've, got, we've got a couple of questions on this topic, so apologies if I don't ask your question exactly how you wanted it to be asked. Um, Muslims believe um, that it wasn't Jesus on the cross in the first place. Uh, the man in his place w was someone else. Um, how could you uh, disprove that claim? Well, this is a very interesting and very important um, question, so thank you for whoever asked it. There is a direct contradiction between the historical account of the life of Jesus in the New Testament and the historical account of the life of Jesus in the Quran, and it's most obvious and most explicit in the question of Jesus' crucifixion. One of the reasons for that is that the Quran goes to so much trouble to repeat again and again and again, assure, I shall now quote from the Quran, assuredly they did not kill him. They were the, under the impression that they had, but they did not crucify him, nor did they kill him. So again and again and again, we have this clear statement that he wasn't crucified and that he wasn't killed. Now, here's why that's such an important distinction. Number one, because it puts the Quran, in this case, at odds with the overwhelming majority of both non-Christian and Christian scholarship. So if you remember the very first quote I mentioned in the talk was from John Dominic Crossan. John Dominic Crossan's mission in life is to debunk and undermine historic Christianity. He said that Jesus' death on the cross is as sure as anything historical can ever be. So the Quran is choosing to question the bit of the New Testament which skeptics think is the most certain thing about the life of Jesus is that he existed and that he died on the cross. I'm not saying the Quran's wrong. I'm just saying we have an immediate problem. We have the vast majority of scholarship, both Christian and non-Christian, which is at odds with what the Quran's saying on that point. Clearly, it's also true that the New Testament and the Quran are at odds on that point. I think all we can do 
is do whatever we would do if we went into the history department, which is that we'd look at the sources, we think what's the best way of assessing the reliability of a source, and we come to our best conclusions. So there are many reasons why I'd favor the New Testament. It has multiple attestations, this event, the crucifixion, has multiple different eyewitness accounts, multiple different documents. In the case of the Quran, we just have one source. Also, the source that we have in the case of the Quran is much later, written down more than 100 or 100 or so years after the event. So the Quran doesn't do well in terms of passing the basic test for historical reliability. That doesn't make it wrong. It just means that if I had to choose about anything else, I would choose the New Testament 10 times out of 10 simply because it does so much better on passing those tests. Fantastic. You'd like to ask a first question from the floor? Yes. yes. Okay, so we, we live in a, in a universe where things seem to obey like constant rules, like stuff doesn't rise from the dead, things like that. And this makes events like people rising from the dead very, very improbable, despite the historical evidence for them and despite the scholarly consensus on yeah. the reality of the, the individual aspects of that evidence. So surely it makes it more likely that we either don't have the right answer to why Jesus didn't rise from the dead, or those, that scholarly consensus is in fact wrong, then Jesus actually rising from the dead. Uh, that's a very good question, very well expressed. I expect most people could hear that as well as I did, but I'll just repeat it. Obviously, dead people don't rise. So... Perhaps we have a problem with the scholarly consensus, but my first instinct, this is me paraphrasing your question, my first instinct is not to think, oh, well, it must have happened. Exactly the opposite. Now, uh, last night, uh, Andrew Sack gave a very, very good answer to this question during his talk, which I, I may not be able to improve upon. What I would say is this, I agree with you absolutely. As I come to this question, as a naturally skeptical person, my default is, well, dead people don't rise. Then I have to say, okay, is it even possible that God exists? Do I have any reasons for thinking that there is even a 1% chance that when the universe burst into existence, there was a first cause outside of time, space, matter, and energy that caused time, space to come into existence? If I think there's a 1% chance that God exists, then at least in theory there is a possibility that this God who exists could choose to feed an event into human history. Because presumably, if he created the fixed laws and constants of our universe, it would be possible for him, seeing as he's supernatural and exists outside of time and space, to feed an event in that doesn't obey the normal rules. And because he's God, presumably, he could do that. So therefore, I think it is at least possible, on that basis, that God, if he really exists, could have wanted to raise Jesus from the dead. Also, in the case of Jesus of Nazareth, I have many other things about his life that make me think that his life is extraordinarily different from any other human life that's ever been lived, and that might make me think, well, goodness me, if God were to send his son onto this planet, I would imagine that whoever that human was would make the kind of impact upon world history that Jesus has made. That doesn't prove that Christianity is true, but it at least helps me to understand how I could come to believe that in this particular case, God did raise Jesus from the dead. Remember, if God is a God of love and made us to have relationship with him, somehow he needs to solve the problem of death so he can get us to be with him forever. And he chooses to do that through the resurrection. And it's a great uh, question. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to break now so um, people can head off to lectures. And please do fill in the comment cards that are on your chairs. That would be really helpful for us. And put down any comments at all. If you absolutely hated me, feel free to say. Um, I, I'd imagine many will. Um, and, uh, and again, if you can come along tonight, um, examine your chances. What if heaven were for free? Half past seven at Elvit Methodist. That would be a great thing to do. Hopefully see you there. Uh, sorry, um, we will continue with questions in about two minutes, so if you can stick around for that, that'd be brilliant as well. Okay, we're going to um, fly straight back into taking um, a few more questions. Um, here's the first one we've got on the phones. Um, Christians believe that through belief in the resurrection, we can achieve eternal life. Why is that something to strive for or of any importance at all? Life starts and ends, it's the way of nature, and it's more bearable than the notion of birth and rebirth. Okay, well, that's an excellent question. I would say that um, 
in Christianity, Christians don't believe in an eternal life because they feel some sort of sense of frustration with this life. Um, the reason why it would be worth believing in eternal life is if you actually had good reason to think that somebody had come back from the dead and told us about it. If we take the view that everybody who has ever died uh, is all in the same boat, then of course we don't know what's beyond death. If, however, Jesus is an individual who went beyond death, saw what was on the other side and came back to tell us, then what he says would be quite significant. That would be a good reason for believing in eternal life. If there's an eternal God who went to all the trouble to create eternal creatures, to create people, presumably there was a reason. And therefore, if his reason is that he wants to have relationship with these people forever, then that would be quite a good reason to make them eternal so that he could enjoy friendship with them forever. Thank you very much. Um, we've got loads. Uh, yeah, was that a question at the back? Or are you just waving? Yes. Okay, this is a very good question. The, the very end of your question, where you say, do you think Christianity would exist as a religion without the resurrection? Absolutely, certainly, there would be no Christianity without the resurrection. What you would have was quite a lot of excitement in the first century. Then the founder of this exciting new thing called the way, dying, and then the whole thing dissipating. So at that point, if you had looked down on the Roman Empire and you had said, okay, you've got to bet either on the most powerful empire in the world, the Roman Empire, crushing this new religious movement within a generation, or you can bet on these 12 fishermen and their new religious movement taking over the entire known world within 300 years, you would definitely bet on the Romans. And yet today... We name our children Andrew, James, Peter, and John, and we name our dogs Caesar and Nero. <laughs> so th there's no doubt at that point you would never, ever, ever bet on the fishermen. To answer your question about on a scale of 1 to 10, the way I'd answer the question would be this. One of the things that we tend to think, particularly at university, is that all the decisions that we made are made on absolute proof where you can have a repeatable experiment. But of course, that isn't actually the case in the decisions we make. So for example, probably everyone in this room has got onto an airplane, and yet none of us knew for certain that that airplane would land safely in the designated destination. So what we did was we reviewed in our mind the safety record of airplanes generally, and that airline in particular, and then we made a reasoned decision that it is reasonable for me to get onto this plane. And I think that the sort of evidence we have for resurrection is similar to the sort of evidence you have in a legal case where a jury and a judge get beyond reasonable doubt. Until you get beyond reasonable doubt, you don't want to be making any decisions, not guilty. You know, you just walk away, I can't get there. But if you do get beyond reasonable doubt, it becomes sensible. In fact, it becomes the right thing to do to, to pass a verdict. I think that's what's happened to me in the case of the resurrection. I think I've got way beyond reasonable doubt, but I don't have the kind of proof that you would be looking for if the only criteria for proof is a repeatable experiment in a science lab. You don't have that for any historical event. So you'd have to literally close down the Durham University History Department if that's the only criteria of proof because you can't prove that anything happened on that basis. So that, that would be that would be my probably best way of trying to answer that. Brilliant. Um, it, I mean, if you've got any follow-up questions, Adrian will be sticking around afterwards, and I think um, it'd be really great to maybe talk to him one-on-one, because we've got loads of questions on roughly the same topic here. Um, do I need to just accept these facts to become a Christian? Uh, is being a Christian just about accepting the facts? Well, this is a great question. What I think happens when somebody puts their trust in Christ is whereas I previously thought that what Christians did was they took a leap of faith. 
I thought there were some people who were brought up in a religious environment, and therefore they have social conditioning that makes them think all these religious thoughts that God exists, that Christianity is true. But they don't really have any other reasons other than my mum and dad think this. And so you take a leap of faith, and you sort of hope for the best. And then you just sort of believe this stuff. Actually, what I think is the case is that you have good reason to think that, take, for example, one of those chairs over there, Noticing what I have about all these other chairs, that they seem to be able to take somebody's weight, noticing that it's exactly the same, noticing that earlier on I was able to put things on it and nothing bad happened, there are good reasons to think that if I sat on that chair it would take my weight. I could do other tests without actually sitting in it, which would confirm me in my view that it would be able to take my weight. I could examine to see if it's got any structural flaws. There still comes a point where I have actually got to put my weight on it but I can get an awful long way towards being confident it will take my weight. That's the journey I think that you go on when you come to faith in Jesus Christ. There are lots of good reasons for thinking that this thing is true, but then there is a final step where you actually commit yourself. Uh, have we got any follow-up specifically to that question that anyone would like to have from the floor? Is it specifically pertaining to this question? Okay. You mentioned earlier the case with the lawyer and the jury reaching a verdict. But the point is, in these cases, practically speaking, you must decide. Right? When you must decide. For example, if, if I decide to sit on the chair, I, I am not necessarily expressing a belief that the chair will support my weight. I am committing to an action, practically speaking, because the situation demands it. Now, in this case, that's just not true. If we do not have, and I, I think the, the, the last question before the break was a very good one, if we do not have principled grounds on which to say, not just this minimal thing that, that okay, God might exist and the whole thing is minimally possible, but if, if we lack principled grounds for saying, actually no, the balance of probabilities favours this overwhelmingly, then the right thing to do is recognise that we don't have to decide, which is suspend judgement, and just say we don't know. Um, but there is no practical constraint here, which says that we must make that commitment. Okay, so this is a very well expressed question. I'm not sure how many of you will have heard all of it, but your question is to do with the nature of evidence that you'd need to make this kind of decision, for example, to follow Christ. That the conditions under which you'd have to commit yourself, that's what I meant to say. I'm sorry if I didn't quite say it well in the way that you'd expressed it. My view is that actually we do have compelling evidence. So let me give you a case study. I didn't used to believe all this stuff. I was trained and conditioned to be a cynic, to doubt it all. It was the strength of the evidence that caused me to change my mind. And in my case, I had good reasons for not wanting to follow Christ because it meant that I would have to change my lifestyle. I didn't want to follow Jesus. I didn't want to go to church. I didn't want to, what I thought was at the time, narrow my field of options in life by going down this road based upon Jesus being the Son of God, but I felt compelled to do so by the strength of the evidence. So my journey was an evidence-based journey, and that's why I'm a Christian today. Does anybody else have a question? Anyone else want to put their hand up? A slightly different topic, if you don't mind. Um, if Christ has no sin in him, then taking ours means he can't enter heaven, which surely means he can't take us and no one can enter. <laughs> okay, so this is a quite detailed question about what Christians call the atonement. It's this very remarkable idea that Christ, who was entirely sinless, became sin for us. Um, the way that Christianity works is that you have to begin to think that Jesus is in a category of one. <laughs> so if there really was a human being who had never sinned, then presumably as he's on the cross, yes, it is true that at that time he does take upon himself the sins of all who trust in him. So at that point he is cut off from God. But it doesn't mean necessarily that after his resurrection and his ascension that he's still in the same situation because at this point he's gone through death. So Christians would say at that point, Jesus is in a different stage of his saving career in that he's now beaten death. So as it were, by taking upon the sins of the world, 
taking upon himself the sins of the world, when he dies, he is separated from his father. But when he bursts through death, he shows that he's beaten sin and death and thrown them away. And in fact, there's lots of writing, for example, in one of the books in the Bible called 1 Corinthians, which talks about Jesus' triumph over death and the fact that he's beaten and discarded and thrown away all these encumbrances. So Jesus does change in his situation as he goes through death into the next life. You also asked a question. Yeah. Hi. Is, is that directly related to that? Oh, no. Do you, do you mind, can we just ask this one? And then, and then, is it? Yeah, sorry, that's fine. Is that is all right? Yeah, yeah. Really sorry. We'll come no, back no, to you no, just no. in one sec. Um, Could we just... Um, uh, the, in the Bible, it said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet come to believe. Um, surely the point is that we'll never know. Um, if we had proof, then we wouldn't actually need faith. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. If we had proof, we wouldn't need faith. And here's one of the fun... This is one of the things that really bothered me when I first thought about Christianity. Why isn't there more evidence? I mean, there is evidence. Probably everyone would agree that in this room would agree that there's at least some evidence, even if you think it's actually tiny or really rather poor. But there isn't so much evidence that it absolutely makes every single person in this room immediately think, yes. So it seems that what God has done is that he hasn't left us with absolutely no evidence so that to believe in him would require a complete leap of faith, nor has he given us so much evidence that absolutely everybody, a bit like a robot, is forced to believe all the same thing. If that were the case, there wouldn't be any universities because there wouldn't be any discussion because everyone in the world would all believe the same stuff. So for some reason, God seems to have set the bar on this scale. between Here's one extreme, here's the other. He set, seems to have set the, 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 the evidence bar, say here, for example. So there's enough evidence for a rational, credible, sane, educated person to make a decision to follow Christ. But there isn't so much that absolutely everybody in the whole world all does the same thing. So it must be the case that God wants there to be an element of choice, and that would make sense if God is actually a God of love. Because if God is a God of love, he would want us to choose to be with him rather than be forced to. There would be absolutely no fun in my marriage if I knew that my wife was being forced against her will to be with me for the last 15 years. There would be no fun at all if I knew that and vice versa. The whole reason why it's fun is she chose me and I chose her. That's, that's why it's enjoyable. And presumably the way that God is thinking is a bit like that. And so he has given us enough evidence to make a reasonable, reasoned decision, but not so much that he compels belief. Because then we'd just be robots and there'd be no point from his point of view. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's been a lot of sort of well-expressed um, opinions, here, so I might be lucky because I'm not entirely sure about resurrection. I think that the issue I really do not like that at all. I think it's incredibly misleading because you're going back and forth, and it was this last point illustrates that quite perfectly that it's both faith and a reasoned response to what. Is, is evidence. In your mind, what is the, the greatest evidence is the gospel accounts. And I think that's sort of a more apologetic explanation for what is it's still a testimony to the supposed truth, but I don't believe that it can prove resurrection. Yeah, I agree with you. Secondly, can I just jump in on that? Because actually, I agree with you entirely. Well, and Oh, go on, sure. Yeah. I think. Another thing what I don't really like that he's taught is that nobody has in their hand a New Testament right in front of you. I know you quote scripture on the board, but I think it's troublesome because I think we should look very deeply into what's said. I know not for this because I'm just saying that I don't agree that the Gospels prove the resurrection at all in the testimony. Um, but you said something like um, they pierced the heart of Jesus. Well, please correct me if I'm wrong. I don't believe the New Testament actually says that pierced his side, didn't pierce his heart. Again, please come back on that. But it, it's just this issue that I have is this misquoting of scripture. Um, you appeal to that as evidence and then misquoting it to me. I may be wrong. It's all in the New Testament. Okay, well, I think, I, I think you make a number of very good points, and I'll probably just move with me trying to go through them one by one. I'm very sympathetic to what you're saying. I'll tell you why, and here I may not help to see you. I was disappointed with this title. I was given this title. And so 
as soon as I saw the title, I thought, I'm in a real trouble here because basically I'm, I'm being set up for a fall, that you can't prove the resurrection on this basis. Okay, so this wasn't my chosen title. I wanted to speak on a different title, but this was the one I agreed to speak on. Oh, I'd be much happier with um, well, anything to do with um, you know, the balance of probabilities, what's the evidence, that sort of thing, or when you're dead, you're dead. Does the evidence for Jesus prove... So, for example, when you're dead, you're dead, does the evidence for the resurrection prove, you know, suggest to the contrary, or what's the role of faith? Those kind of things are much... I know that's, that's a really good point you make. Is it circular argument? I agree with you. And um, one of the kind of things about this week is the talks build sequentially. So yesterday I did try and make an, an argument for the reliability of the Bible using non-biblical sources. So for the first 50, 60% of yesterday's talk, we didn't look at the Bible at all. I was looking at non-biblical sources. But I completely agree with you that if it is the case that really you're just trying to assume that the Bible is true, reliable, and then you argue from the resurrection for that, then you, eventually you end up arguing in a circle. I also agree with you that the ideal scenario would be that everybody has all the documents in front of them, and then you're absolutely right. If there are mistakes that are made, possibly even genuine mistakes that I might make, then you can point them out. And I, I agree with you. That would be a much better scenario. A absolutely. And I worked quite hard yesterday. Uh, yesterday I was working quite hard to have restrained results, cautious approach. Let's, let's look. And I, I, all I came up with was seven facts or seven things about the life of Jesus that we could draw from non-biblical testimony. I wasn't therefore saying, so Christianity is true. I said, look, clearly it's not a complete load of nonsense because we've at least got these five non-biblical sources giving us these seven pieces of information. So we do know something about the historical Jesus from outside the Bible. That's what I was saying yesterday. I'm, I'm, really, I'm really, really, I'm really, really sorry. Do you mind if we just, if we just jump yeah, off the queue on this? I'm sure Edge is happy to carry on. Mm -hmm carry on talking afterwards. Um, so the final question, uh, again, I'm throwing a few together, so apologies if we haven't asked yours. Um, so uh, all of your alternative explanations um, for the claim that Jesus rose are, are pretty shaky, uh, admittedly. Um, aren't they still more plausible than the claim that Jesus did actually rise from the dead? Well, I think that's a great question, and I think only you can answer that. Whoever asked the question, I think at the end of the day, if you think it is more probable that Christianity is based on mass hallucination, if you think it's more probable that actually the disciples stole the body, well, there's, there's your conclusion. I mean, that isn't the conclusion that I came to myself, and I don't think that is the best conclusion, because it doesn't account for all the facts that aren't in dispute. I think in particular, I would be looking for an alternative explanation for the empty tomb. That would be a key, or possibly even showing that the tomb wasn't empty. So let's just um, refer to the Apostle Paul. He said, if Christ is not raised, our faith is in vain. So in a sense, this is quite a safe situation for us to be in because Christianity is a falsifiable religion. If, if we can find evidence that shows that Jesus never rose from the dead, then we know that Christianity isn't true and we, we can all go and do something else more useful than sitting here talking about the resurrection. There must be something else we could do that would be more useful. So if there is good evidence that Christ wasn't raised well, then Christianity isn't true. If Christ wasn't raised, our faith is in vain and end of discussion. However, if there is good evidence, then we would be sensible, as Tom was saying earlier, to pursue and keep looking in that direction because presumably something amazing has happened and that there is a God who loves us enough to send his son into the world to die in our place, to beat death, and there's a way we can go to heaven. So that would be huge. So either way, this is a big deal. We're going to formally uh, call a halt proceedings there. Thank you very much, Adrian. Thank you for your questions as well. Really sorry if we didn't get round um, to answering one of your questions. There are people in um, hideous red um, sort of round-necked sweats. Um, they're around. Uh, and so if you'd like to ask a question, why not go and corner one of them? Um, tomorrow, the lunch bar, as I've said, um, is at St. Oswald's, um, which is um, the church building by the Zebra Crossing up towards the library. So hopefully see you there. It would be really great as well if you could um, come along tonight, 7.30, Elvit Methodist, what if heaven were for free? Thank you very much for coming and hopefully see you through the rest of the week.